Greetings from Delray Beach, Florida. We have a nice little thunderstorm, lightning storm, and rainstorm going on right now. Um, so wherever you are, I hope you are staying safe. And I can't wait to meet everybody when we all return to Glen Eagle. And again, this is a special evening. We are welcoming Dr. Watson to Zoom again. And I wish we could visit him in person. I wish he could visit us in person. You know, we have lots of cookies. Yeah. And I think the, the Marks even said something about some coffee. I think you like some a particular coffee, Dr. Watson? It's the company that I like the most. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, they have, they have your, they have the company and your coffee. Yes. So sorry about that. I will Anyways. admit that the cookies are a really close second though. <laughs> yeah. And I realize that all these other country clubs have cookies too, but you know that ours are the best, yeah, right? That's right. That's right. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I don't want to uh, take any more uh, time out. So everybody, we can all put a little virtual hand, our hands together for a warm welcome for Dr. Robert Watson. Okay. So thank you, Tammy. I'm going to share screen everybody. So I hope you can see, uh, the screen, you should be looking at a Republican and Democratic uh, elephant and donkey. So, uh, hello, it's Saturday night. Woohoo! <laughs> Thank you, Tammy. I appreciate uh, the introduction and, and the thoughtfulness. Uh, I wish I could, in all seriousness, I wish I could be there in person. Uh, I'm sure all of you are like me in that this seven months of social distancing is really getting old, but we have to do what we have to do. We have to wear our masks, be safe, think of others, and, and here we are. So, but I'm delighted to be able to come out and hope that this helps a wee bit. So here's what I did. Um, I've been getting a lot of phone calls and emails lately. And the last two weeks, it's just been, I've been inundated. I spent the entire day today, all day from 8 a.m. till now, just answering emails from the last two weeks. I had several thousand. Uh, and I, I can't go to Publix or the, or the gas station without lots of folks yelling. Everybody's talking about politics and the election. So what I did uh, to try to answer everyone's questions, I put together the 10 most commonly asked questions uh, over the last couple of days and weeks. And I'm going to talk about them and try to answer them for you. I want to get into some detail on um, if there's a, you know, if this thing goes nuclear, right? and we don't have a result on election night, which I don't think we will. This is not gonna be an election day, it'll be an election month. Um, what does the constitution say? What do the laws say? How do we count the votes? How many days do we have to count the votes? When must the electors in the electoral college be seated to count the votes? Questions like that. So I'm gonna cover a lot of that. Then of course, as you all know, um, my favorite part of these programs besides the cookies is the Q&A at the end. So have at me and I'm happy to answer uh, your questions. So let's go. So here's the first question that everybody's asking and I think it's an appropriate place to start. Will there be a peaceful transfer of power? Um, so let me say first off that there's a difference between a peaceful transfer of power and a civil transfer of power. A peaceful transfer of power is if the outgoing president uh, does not refuse to uh, protest and, and goes of his own accord. Uh, if the outgoing president refuses to leave, uh, then we wouldn't have a peaceful transfer of power. America has been blessed in that for our entire existence, we have always had peaceful transfers of power. The tanks don't roll out on the streets, so to speak. Uh, a civil transfer of power is when the outgoing administration and president cooperate with the incoming administration and president. So that's the difference between peaceful and civil. Um, now my concern is multiple. Um, Donald Trump has said he w w refuses uh, to assure uh, a peaceful or civil transfer of power. He's been asked many times, even on a debate stage, and he refuses to answer it. Uh, in 2016, he said, and to my friends out there that like Donald Trump, I'm not being partisan and I'm not uh, picking on him, I'm repeating his words. In 2016, he said repeatedly that the only way he loses is if it's a fraud, a hoax, and if Hillary steals the election. 
He said for quite some time now that the only way he loses on November 3rd is if it's a fraud, a hoax, or if Biden and the Democrats steal the election. So Trump has given us every single indicator that he will not uh, assure a peaceful and civil transfer of power, and he said as much. So that's worrisome. So we have had, as I said, a peaceful transfer of power every single election in our history. We have had a civil transfer of power every single election but two, but two. And you're looking at them at the bottom of your screen. Um, I'm a John Adams fan, and I've never liked Thomas Jefferson, so it pains me to say the following, but uh, in 1801, John Adams was not civil uh, with the transition, transition or transfer of power to Thomas Jefferson. Um, uh, back then, the inauguration was on March 4th. Uh, today, the inauguration is on January 20th, as you all know. It was moved up uh, because of the 20th Amendment, and the year that it was moved up to where it is today was 1937. So that was for FDR's second inaugural. So John Adams um, was a great man, but he was thin-skinned. He was so upset at Thomas Jefferson that in the middle of the night, the night before the inauguration, Adams loaded up his carriage and snuck out of the capital city under the cover of darkness. Jefferson arrived for the inaugural and there was no John Adams, no outgoing president. So that wasn't civil and there was no cooperation between the two on the machinery of government. Now, why was Adams so upset at Jefferson? Jefferson had been Adams's close friend and he had been Adams's vice president. Um, so Adams was appalled that his friend and vice president would challenge him and the campaign got a little bit uh, ugly. Um, so back then, uh, it, what, the way it worked was the person with the most votes became president, the person with the second most votes became vice president. So that's how you had Adams of one political party and Jefferson of another political party as the president and vice president. It was because of the 1796 election. We changed the way we run elections in the year 1804. From then on, uh, the president and vice president run as a ticket. And they ran in part because of this debacle and in part because uh, Jefferson's vice president, Aaron Burr, would shoot and kill Alexander Hamilton. So from 1804 on, they run as a, as a group. So Adams was so upset with Jefferson that he snuck out of the city and uh, there was no civil transfer of power. Now, it wasn't a big deal because in 18... Oh, one, we did not have nuclear weapons <laughs> and the existential threat from them, international terrorism and everything else. Plus, because Jefferson had been the vice president and had spent a lot of time in, the, in, the, in Philadelphia when it was the capital, Jefferson knew what to expect. So that was one. The second uh, time when we did not have a civil transfer of power was with my buddy, my hero, Harry Truman. And I've been out enough to Glen Eagles that all of you know I'm a Harry Truman fan. So what we can do, you can all play, since it's a Saturday night, and Tammy, you're welcome to join us. We can all play that drinking game. Whenever I mention Truman, have a drink, everybody. So have your first drink of the night. Oh, good. There we go. You go, Tammy. Uh, I hope it's something harder in there than water. Um, but uh, <laughs> so when Truman was leaving office in 1953, I'm sad to say that Ike stiffed Harry. Eisenhower refused to get out of the car and come in and see Truman. Truman had given the staff off and he was prepared to sit and talk with Ike, tea, scones, a tour of the White House and all that, and Eisenhower stiffed him. Um, now, why is this such an issue? We have to have a civil transfer of power for the following issue. Imagine being winning the election and being the new president. First off, you only have a few weeks until January 20th to get ready to govern. And if this election on November 3rd lasts, lasts for days and weeks, as I think it may, and almost every analyst is saying it will, um, what's going to happen is the winner, a Trump second term or Biden, they're going to have a truncated period of time. Imagine if Joe Biden wins and this election drags on a month. He'll only have a few days, weeks, you know, to make his appointments. The incoming president must make between 4,000 
and 5,000 appointments by January 20th. And they have to have them vetted, screened, prepped, briefed, and over 1,000 of those appointments require Senate confirmation. So it's an extraordinary deal. Here's the other uh, challenge. Here's the other reason why it's important to have a civil transfer of power. The transfer begins early. Uh, it's already started, in fact. Joe Biden, weeks ago, put together his transition team. Um, why? You have to go through the logistics, the operational aspects, uh, security briefings, even the IT aspects of it. Think about how many thousands of computers the federal government has, Department of Treasury, Department of State, Department of Defense, CIA, FBI. You have to have all the um, uh, passwords, the codes. You have to be briefed, prepped, ready to go. So it is an enormous undertaking. So starting weeks early, here's what happens. The outgoing administration puts together an agency transition team. There'll be a small group of folks from each of the 15 departments, state, treasury, commerce, homeland security, justice, and so on. And they meet with the incoming president's team and start preparing for the possibility of a transition. Uh, now, one of the priorities from Barack Obama was that there should be funding for this. So in 2010, and you can see it on the screen there, in 2010, there was a $7 million budget that is given to the incoming president. Joe Biden is already using this. His team has office space, computers, and everything else to prepare uh, for this. Um, so um, the, the process really began with my hero, Harry Truman. So Tammy, have your second drink. Um, <laughs> so uh, I'm saving mine for afterwards, but I'm counting how many drinks I get to have since I don't get any cookies tonight. Um, so, um, uh, it began with Harry Truman. Truman, as you know, was picked as FDR's uh, vice president only in 44. And when Truman became vice president, he was only vice president for what, 82, 83 days before Franklin Roosevelt died of a cerebral hemorrhage on April 12, 1945 in Warm Springs, Georgia. Truman wasn't even briefed on the Manhattan Project. So you talk about having to hit the ground running at one of the most critical periods in world history. So Truman made sure that his vice president was briefed, Alvin Barkley, and that when he was leaving office, he offered all the briefings and support to Eisenhower, who didn't take it. Then Kennedy realized this was important. Kennedy, remember, of course, had the Bay of Pigs and the Cuban Missile Crisis. He knew that in the case of a nuclear attack, the incoming president didn't even have one minute before they had to be ready to govern. So Kennedy was working on this, but of course he was shot and killed. So the first president that really fully put it into place was Lyndon Johnson. And ever since then, we've had these kind of briefings. I'm pleased to say that George Bush the first was gracious and helpful with Bill Clinton coming in. Bill Clinton was gracious and helpful with George W. Bush. W was helpful and gracious with Obama, and Obama was with Trump. I believe this ends. I can't, for the life of me, and I put my lung and kidney on it, there's no way Trump is going to be civil. There's no way Trump is going to help uh, Biden uh, prepare to govern. What worries me is already we're seeing the Trump people are not cooperating. So it would constitute the first time in a long, long time. Um, and in a dangerous world, the incoming presidential team needs to have everything ready to go. So I really, really worry about that. I also worry about civil unrest in the streets. So peaceful and civil transfer of power. Second question I'm, I hear all the time. Will the Democrats pack the Supreme Court? Okay, if you pack the court, that means you add justices. If you unpack the court, that means you remove justices. So here's your trivia. Uh, if the Democrats pack or unpack the Supreme Court, will they need a constitutional amendment? The answer, no. It doesn't say in the Constitution how many justices are in the Supreme Court. There on the screen, I put Article 3 for you. Article 1, there's seven articles in the Constitution, 27 amendments. Article 1 is about the Congress, Article 2 about the presidents, 
an Article Three about the judiciary. It says nothing in Article Three about how many justices there need to be. So the Democrats could pack it or unpack it, and all they would need is to pass a law. So here's your second trivia question. Has any president in history packed the court? The answer, yes, on multiple occasions. Has any president in history unpacked the court? That is reduced the number of justices. The answer is yes. So it's perfectly within the precedent for the Democrats or Biden to pack or unpack, and all they need to do is pass a law. Now, what happened was, as you know, in the hot, humid summer of 1787 in Philadelphia, when the framers were working on the Constitution, you know, you know tempers were fraying. They were at one another's nerves. So what they did was, uh, by the time they got around to the judiciary, you know, the world had never known a judiciary like we were creating in a government of, by, and for the people, as Lincoln would later say. So the framers left it vague, figuring that we could fix it by legislation. They were worried that if they put too much detail into the um, uh, Article Three and into what the Supreme Court would look like, that we wouldn't sign the Constitution. So they just put something quick together and said, let's get this thing signed and we'll deal with the Supreme Court in the details later. So that's what they did. Where does the, the number of justices come from? You're looking at it on the screen. In 1789, the Judiciary Act set the number of justices on the high court. It was the first bill that the Senate worked on and the first major piece of legislation. How many justices did the 1789 Judiciary Act create? The answer, six, not nine, six. So there are only six justices. It's been moved up and down several times. So the framers left it vague, as I said, so that we could amend it and prove it and all that later. They also knew that George Washington would be the first president. And through his every action and inaction, he would uh, forge the office of the president as well as the judiciary. They also knew the guy that you're looking at on the left side of your screen, that's John Jay. They suspected he'd be the first chief justice, and he was. And we were blessed because he was a great man and a great justice, and John Jay forges the precedents of the Supreme Court that we know today. The fellow on your right that you're looking at is John Marshall, easily one of the greatest chief justices in history, if not the greatest, served for 34 years. So once you have people like John Jay and John Marshall, the court takes the uh, tone of what we know today. So how did we get from six justices at the beginning to where we are today? Here you are, I made a list for you. So I put on the screen there all the times the Supreme Court has changed. So it was initially six, as I told you. Uh, in 1801, John Adams unpacked the court, took it down to five. In 1802, Jefferson packed it and took it up to six. Uh, in 1807, Jefferson moved it up to seven. Uh, after complaining that nobody should touch it, he touched it twice. Uh, in 1837, Andrew Jackson moved it to nine. Abraham Lincoln took it to 10. After the Civil War, Andrew Johnson unpacked it down to seven. And then uh, in 1869, it was Ulysses Grant uh, who set it at its current number, nine. And we have had nine justices ever since Ulysses Grant. That's where the number nine comes from. How did they pick nine? Here's how. There were nine appellate courts. So they wanted the number of courts to equal the number of justices. So if you follow that train of thought today, today we have 13 courts. So we should add four justices to get it to 13. That's the you know logic. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt tried to pack the court back in 1937. Uh, he was frustrated because uh, some conservative justices on the court were not supporting his new deal and his plans to save the economy, nor were they supporting his plans to try to start preparing for World War II and things that would become, you know, the Lend-Lease Act and things of that effect. So FDR's plan, which was kind of cockamamie, quite frankly, uh, it was malarkey, as Biden would say. He wanted to add one justice for each justice over the age of 70. So that was the idea. Um, I have a, uh, an idea, and I'd like to share with all of you. 
and that is this. As you probably have guessed, I'm not a fan of Amy Coney Barrett. Um, uh, I think she's, I, I'm a feminist, I'm pro-woman, and I don't think she is. Uh, I disagree with her on a number of issues. She also, when asked about it, said, I've never really thought about climate change. How the hell do you not have a firm opinion about climate change? It's an existential threat to the planet. I mean, good gracious. And the idea of hers that climate change is not a fixed, settled argument, like it's still open to the debate and interpretation. Well, maybe I don't have a firm opinion on gravity <laughs> or whether the earth is flat or round. But um, so here's my, my beef with just Judge Barrett. She is an originalist. So we tend to have, and those of you with law degrees and any judges there at Glen Eagles, you know this better than anyone. There tends to be two basic interpretations or views of the Constitution. The first one is originalism. Originalism. What that says is we should understand the Constitution in a very narrow way as it was originally conceived by the framers when they were working on it in 1787. Now, I think that's baloney. That's just my opinion. Uh, conservative Republicans tend to accept this, but most Republicans and Democrats reject it. If you take an originalist view like Justice Barrett, here's what that means. Women can't vote. Blacks are three-fifths of a person. Slavery's legal. I mean, that was the original Constitution. How do we even think about things like um, space travel and genetic engineering and nuclear weapons and, 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 you know, the coronavirus. None of that was in the original and was around. So I reject originalism. I favor more of an interpretive implied perspective that most people take. That's what George Washington supported. Washington immediately in his presidency realized that as he looked to the Constitution for guidance, and we always should, but he realized it didn't answer the questions he had on how to govern. So he asked Alexander Hamilton if he would help him. And in one night, Hamilton wrote a legal brief about this thick, which came up with the idea of implied powers. And that's what we all use today from George Washington up. And that is, in order for the Constitution to be relevant, here we are well over two centuries later, for this thing to be a living, breathing, relevant document, it needs to adapt to the times. Yes, consider the original, no question. I, I, I love my constitution, but adapt it to the times. If we had taken a strict Amy Coney Barrett originalism perspective of the constitution, it would have been relevant for about 20 years and that's it. Uh, so I disagree with that. So here's my idea. Since everything Justice Barrett has written and said is all originalism, 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 and you heard her during her hearings when she didn't want to answer, she just said originalism. I say, okay, let's go back to the original for Justice Barrett. We had six justices, so we need to get rid of three. The way you unpack is you use LIFO, last in, first out. So if we follow Justice Barrett's arguments, we should unpack the court back to six and get rid of the three appointments from Trump. That's originalism, that's what she's saying. Okay, so uh, we've had a lot of attempts, as I said, to pack and unpack the court. Um, the Republicans have, and Republican friends there, I'm not picking on you, I'm just being factual. The Republicans are saying that uh, the effort by Biden and Harris, and of course, both of them ducked the question big time during the debates. The effort, if they should pursue it, to pack or unpack the court, Republicans are saying it's unprecedented. No, it's not. I just showed you how many times it was done, who did it, and when it was done. So what I did is I looked at the last 20 years, and there have been efforts in the states to pack and unpack the courts, of the state Supreme Courts over the last 20 years. Here I made a list for you. It's on the screen. Ten times in the last 20 years, the states have tried to pack or unpack their courts. All of them were done by Republicans. So, you know. Um, Two were successful. Arizona and Georgia both packed and added two justices. Eight of the efforts were unsuccessful, including the effort by Florida. And of course, there's some efforts that are somewhat reasonable and some that are screwy. The most blatantly pathetic is, of course, Florida. We tried to add eight justices. 
<laughs> not one or two. And then we tried to create two Supreme Courts. Oh my God. How do you even explain that besides it being Florida? The answer is Jeb Bush and Rick Scott. Um, so um, here you go. Here's what is being proposed, and I do favor these. Um, so a group of legal scholars, uh, that is uh, Ivy League law professors, former judges, they're worried that the high court has become helplessly, hopelessly politicized. You'd all probably agree. Um, it's hard to imagine these days any justice being appointed on anything but straight partisan party line voting. Right, everybody? Um, we saw Mitch McConnell refuse to give Obama his appointment of Merrick Garland. Uh, and McConnell and every single Republican in the Senate said that it was utterly unprecedented for a president to get to make an appointment in the last year in office. Garland was being a nominated by Obama a little over eight months before the election. Is that true that no president ever gets a final year appointment? The answer is no. Uh, roughly 30 judges have been appointed in the last year of a presidential term. During Reagan's final year in office, he had a total of 33 appointments to various positions in the government. So that was a bold faced lie by McConnell and everybody in the party. Um, so McConnell wouldn't let um, uh, Merrick Garland get an appointment, uh, but Merrick Garland wasn't the only one. Uh, there were several dozen appointments that Obama had pending in the district courts and the appellate courts. Those are the courts of appeal. Uh, Mitch McConnell did not let Obama get his appointments, dozens and dozens of them, for well over a year, almost two years in office. That's, now that's what is unprecedented. That's remarkable. I personally feel that's a violation of the Constitution, and I'll put my entire reputation on it. Why? The Constitution says that the Senate has advise and consent responsibilities. That means when a president nominates a cabinet member, an ambassador, or a judge, the Senate must advise and consent and vote in a timely manner up and down on that appointment. Uh, you can't, like McConnell did dozens and dozens of times for way over a year, refuse to fulfill your, your constitutional obligation. So I was furious at McConnell and the Republicans for shredding our constitution for well over a year, but I was also furious at the Democrats for being so pathetically weak to bring it up. And I was also angry at the media for not educating the public. So we have a crisis in our courts. So here's what nonpartisan legal experts are, are proposing. Are you ready? Three proposals. Number one, they're proposing we move the Supreme Court to 15. We have 15 justices. To depoliticize it, here's the proposal. The Democrats get five, the Republicans get five, and then the last five are appointed by the 10 justices on the court. And they serve one year rotating terms and they're picked from the appellate courts. So that way they already have experience. The appellate courts should be a good, you know, uh, bench, a warm up session for the Supreme Court. So that's one proposal. I don't know if anybody out there likes it or agrees with it. The second proposal is to have nine justices, but to make them rotating from the appellate courts and to shorten the length of terms. The third proposal is for term limits. Right now, the Supreme Court serves for life. I have always opposed that. I've been a professor for 30 years, even though you all know I'm only 27. <laughs> um, for all 30 years of my career, I have opposed life terms for the Supreme Court. I have favored 10-year term limits for the Supreme Court. We have a couple proposals right now. One is for 18-year terms, one is for 15, and one is for 10. So there we go. Where did the idea of uh, life terms from the Supreme Court come from? It came from this, the good behavior clause. And there you can see it on your screen. And they even spell it the way the English spell it with the U, good behavior. This comes from English common law. It, historically, centuries ago in English common law, can you believe on a Saturday night, Tammy, you're hearing about English common law? What a hell of a way to spend a Saturday night. All of you, let me just say the word Truman so you can have your third drink. Truman, okay, so English common law. Here's what it said and where it comes from. Um, 
the idea was for the judiciary, for judges to be independent, to not be beholden to political pressures, to be insulated from them. And also for the courts to form a check and a balance against the power of executives or kings or legislatures, judges would serve for life. Make sense? That's where it came from. The founding fathers, the framers, borrowed English common law and said, let's give our Supreme Court a life term, good behavior. And it's in Article I, Section 1. Um, now, here's the problem with it, and I've always opposed this. Back when, hundreds of years ago, in English common law, people lived to be 30 or 40 years old. When the framers wrote the Constitution, the average life expectancy was about 40. Uh, they could not contemplate uh, us living to be 90, 100 plus. Um, you know, Ben Franklin was the only person of, of advanced age that anybody had ever met. He was in his 80s, which is like the new 152 today. <laughs> um, so um, uh, think of uh, Trump's three appointments, like Barrett. What's Barrett, like 48? She's a decade younger than me. Trump's three appointments on the court, if they have good health, could easily serve for over four decades on the court. I don't think that's democracy. I think it's, it's ridiculous. Look at the bottom of your screen, the last bullet point. So what I did since 1981 uh, I added up the average length that a Supreme Court justice serves. It's 26 years. I mean, look at this, Justices Douglas, uh, Field, uh, Black, Stevens, all of them served well over 34 years. This is crazy. Uh, in a democracy, you shouldn't have just nine people impacting our Constitution for decades. So I think we need to get rid of, of, of these life terms. Um, uh, I'm going to skip this one. Okay. The fourth question I'm asked by everybody is what happens if the president or vice president or Biden or Harris die? No, that's morbid. But right now, everybody, we have a, a global pandemic and the president has already contracted it. In fact, the president is the country's leading super spreader of the virus. We have a lot of his aides have contracted it. You have some of the Secret Service and generals, military detachment around him have contracted it. And you also have um, two of the White House ushers or butlers have contracted it. So, uh, and Trump is not a spring chicken, uh, even though Trump is an energizer bunny. The guy has so much energy. You know, he lives on McDonald's. Um, so he's not exactly the healthiest person. So um, I think it's a very real thing that we need to think. What if Trump or Pence or Biden or Harris contracts this and dies? So um, what we have is we have a line of secession. You've heard of this. If the president dies, who becomes president? The vice president. Uh, and that's from our Constitution. And I put it on the screen here for you. Article 2, Section 1, Clause 6. Don't worry, there's not a test after this. <laughs> so... Um, at any rate, so the Constitution says if the president dies, the vice president becomes president. Now, what happens if they both die? Uh, the earliest law said that you go president, vice president, then president pro tem of the Senate, and then Speaker of the House. That's what the earliest law said from 1792. That was changed in 1886. In 1886, uh, Grover Cleveland's vice president, Thomas Hendricks, died, uh, and people were worried about that, so they quickly changed the law. So here's what the law says. Uh, you go president, vice president, you skip the two congressional leaders, and you go to the cabinet. Now, that was changed again in 1947. And from 1947 until today, here is our line of secession. Who changed it in 1947? Get a drink, everybody. My boy, Harry Truman. So uh, there's, uh, there we go. Tammy, you're going to be smiling or prone by the end of this lecture. So, um, and I'm going to have a fun evening when I go home. So um, here's the way the line of secession works now. The president, if he dies, the vice president, Pence. If they die, it goes to the speaker. That's Pelosi. If she dies, it goes to the president pro tem of the Senate. That's Chuck Grassley that you see here from Iowa. If those four die, then it goes to the cabinet. We have 15 cabinet departments. It goes in order that they were created. 
So the first cabinet department was state when Washington picked Jefferson. Secretary of State is now Pompeo, so that's fifth. If, if something happens to him, the second cabinet was uh, Treasury. When Hamilton was appointed, the Treasury Secretary is Mnuchin. Good God. <laughs> um, if something happens to them, it then goes to defense, which is Asp Asper. And if something happens to him, it then goes to justice, which is William Barr. And then it works through the other 11, ending up at Secretary of Homeland Security, the most recent. So that's the line of secession, everybody. And in a nuclear day and age, you know, we need to think about this. Hey, at 9-11, that final airplane that was brought down in a field in Pennsylvania, it could have been headed to the Capitol um, or White House, right? Uh, and we all know during a State of the Union address or an inauguration, the entire government is there and with biological and chemical weapons and who knows what could happen. So I put on the screen there, continuity in government. After 9-11, there was a secret commission put together to try to figure out what happens if the four people you're looking at on your screen die and all 15 cabinet officers die. Here's what we think they put together in a secret commission. It then goes to the governors and it goes to the governors in the order that they were created, the state was created. So the first state, second state, third state, all the way to Hawaii, which is the 50th state uh, in 1959. So that's the line of secession now. What happens if all 50 governors also are killed? I think by then you just kiss your ass goodbye because <laughs> we're in trouble. Um, now the 20th amendment, that was in the 1930s. What that said is if the president elect dies, the vice president elect would then take over. So there's three different categories here to think about. If you run for president, you're a presidential candidate. If you win your party's nomination at the conventions in the summer, you become the presidential nominee. If you win the election, you become the president elect. So if Trump or Biden, whichever one wins, if they were to pass away after the election, their vice president, according to the 20th Amendment, uh, Pence or Harris would become uh, the president elect, then they would work with the party and pick their VP. Got it? What happens if Trump or Biden passes away between now and November 3rd? There's nothing in the Constitution and there's no statute. Nothing. What would happen is both the Democratic and Republican National Committees have a rule that if that contingency happens, the committee would work with the surviving person, the VP or whatever, and then pick someone new. So that's what would happen. The 25th Amendment from the 1960s, this is what happens if the president is incapacitated. Let's say hypothetically the president is stark raving mad and shouldn't be president. Um, there's a way to remove them. There's two ways to remove the president. Number one, it requires the vice president, Pence, and uh, over half the cabinet, a majority of the cabinet. We have 15 cabinet, so that means eight. So Pence and eight cabinet members would, need, would agree in writing to say Trump is mentally whacked, he should be removed from office. The second way to do it is the vice president and a majority of Congress. They have to write that Trump's whacked and should be removed from office. Then the president has time to write a letter, a couple days, and say he's not whacked and wants to stay in office. Then Congress has about 20 days to meet and vote on whether to throw him out or return him to power. That's what the 25th Amendment says. Okay, fifth question. What's gonna happen on election night? Are you ready for this? All right, so the first thing I wanna say is um, Trump has suggested this. Uh, his uh, son-in-law, Jared Kushner, has, has suggested this, and it's been on Republican uh, talk stations. Can the president postpone the election? The answer is, by law, by constitution, no. No. Can Congress postpone the election? Yes. Yeah, they could by passing a law, but not the president. So when Trump suggested it and Jared Kushner talked about it, that they need to read their constitution. It, you can't, they can't do it. Okay, so what may happen on election night? Um, must we, by law, know who the president is by the end of the night? The answer is no. Have we had elections in history where we've gone to bed on election night not known who the president is? Yes. Have we had elections in history that lasted days? Yes. 
Weeks, yes. Months, yes. So Trump has been lately saying, we have to know an election night, we should know an election night. That's not legal and it's not constitutional. So don't listen to him. Um, here's the two dates you need to remember. Look at the bottom of your screen there, my last two bullet points. By law, we have 35 days, we, we being the states, to count the vote. 35 days after the election, December 7th. So we have till December 7th to count the votes. The Republicans have filed multiple lawsuits trying to stop this. It's illegal, unless if somehow they win a lawsuit and the court overrules. But um, and Trump's been saying you can't do that. By law, you can. So don't listen to him. Uh, when must the electors be selected, seated, and vote? That's the electors of the Electoral College. Here's the answer, by law, by Constitution. The first Monday after the second Wednesday in December, and I'm not making that crap up. That means December 14th. We have until December 14th before the electors have to cast their vote. So that's what may happen. So I think on election night, late at night, we're going to have no idea who the president is. States are going to be overrun with votes by mail and are going to have to count all those. Trump will declare himself the president. He'll say it was a beautiful election. It was the greatest in history, and I won by the largest margin in history. Why will he say that? Because that's what he says every day. Um, and then he'll claim that F any effort by the Democrats to continue to count the vote is a hoax and a fraud. Why will he say that? Because he says it every day. So to all my Republican buddies out there, I'm not being mean. I'm simply repeating what Trump says every day of the week. Um, so uh, I don't think we're going to know what's going to happen. My concern is we could have civil unrest. I think both sides will take to the streets. So what else will happen? Uh, Trump has said that, you know, early voting is, is fraudulent. No, it's not. Four-fifths of the states have early voting. Florida has early voting, everybody. We have early voting. Um, and it started already. You can vote now. Maybe some of you have already voted. I always like to vote early or vote by mail, but this time I'm waiting until election day because my 20-year-old son, this is his very first presidential election, and he wants to go on election day and vote, so I'm going to wait and go with him. Uh, I've been carrying, I carried him into the polls from the time he was born, so he's gone every, all the time. So at any rate, um, uh, Trump has also said voting by mail is fraudulent. No, it's not. Every single state has vote by mail. Every single state. Two thirds of the states, including Florida, have what's called no fault vote by mail. That is, you don't need a reason to vote by mail. Anybody that's been here a while, do you remember years ago? I remember in Florida, you needed to have a reason uh, why you wanted to vote by mail. Now you don't. You can just say, mail me a ballot. Five states have automatic vote by mail, including Hawaii. I used to teach at the University of Hawaii. Those five states, you have automatic. That means they automatically mail all the voters a vote by mail application. There you go. Uh, here's the, the sixth question I'm getting. Will Republicans file lawsuits? The answer is yes, they already have. There's over 40 lawsuits filed by the Republican Party in 15 states. What are the lawsuits trying to do? Limit the counting, limit access to voting by mail, reducing votes by mail. Uh, I'm not being biased and being honest. The Republicans are trying to suppress the vote. Uh, they're trying to, uh, in some red states, they banned college student, uh, excuse me, college campuses from being precincts. A college campus should always be a precinct. Everybody knows where it is. There's plenty of parking and young people vote. They've also, Republicans have closed uh, precincts in black communities. I don't have to say anything else about that. Also, in several states, by law, you have to have a place to drop your vote, a drop box. It just doesn't say how many. So in Republican states, like in Texas, the Republican governor, Abbott, has only one drop box per county. <laughs> That's all in an effort to try to suppress the vote. Uh, now, in, as you know, in some Counties in Texas are bigger than countries. <laughs> so uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, here's a list of some of the lawsuits the Republicans have filed. Um, I think what's going to happen, 
the day after the election, we're still going to be counting votes. People are going to be angry. They're going to take to the streets. And I think the Republicans will file lawsuits in every close state that Trump loses. Why do I think this? Because they have on retainer armies of attorneys, entire law firms on retainer ready to go. The Democrats are now playing catch up. They're getting lawyers. They just put two solici former solicitors general on a retainer. The solicitor general, that's the person that tries the case for the uh, government. Okay, seventh question I get, is there a nuclear option? So what happens if after a month, we're still counting votes, people are in the streets, the electoral college, the electors are fighting, uh, red and blue states don't wanna seat their electors, Trump has been claiming a victory, he wants it to go to the courts. There are two nuclear options. Here's the first one. Uh, the Constitution does say that the states, and you can see I have it there, Article 2, the states can appoint in such a manner that they seem fit. The state legislature can appoint uh, the electors. Must the state legislature, legislature appoint the electors that the people voted for? So if the people vote Republican, must they appoint Republican electors and vice versa? The answer is no. Have the states ever appointed electors that went against the way the people have voted? Yes, that's happened in history. The Bush versus Gore Supreme Court debacle uh, created yet another precedent that they threw it back to the states. So here you go, nuclear scenario one. You could have a situation where a month into this thing, Trump asks red states, go ahead and certify your electors to vote for me. And legally, they could do that. They could. Here you go. We have six states right now, six swing states that are so close, nobody knows how they're going to vote. All six have Republican legislatures. Advantage Trump. Right now, 28 of the states are in Republican control. Advantage Trump. What's the second uh, nuclear scenario? The second nuclear scenario is the Electoral College tiebreaker. There are 538 electoral votes. That's 435 members of the House plus 100 members of the Senate equals 535 plus three members from DC equals 538. The winner needs a majority of 538. Here's the big number to remember everybody. A majority of 538 is 270, 270. So the first person past 270, bum, bum, ba -dum, they're the president. Got it? So we got to get to 270. If no one gets to 270, there's a tiebreaker. In history, have we had a scenario where nobody got a majority and we had to have a tiebreaker? Yes, multiple times. So it's with precedent. So how does the tiebreaker work? If no one gets to 270, if Biden is 260 and Trump has 170 and there's 100 and some 200, you know, electoral votes still undecided, nobody can figure out. Here's how the Electoral College tiebreaker works. It's up to the House of Representatives. Now, Democrats, I can see you smiling because the Democrats have a big majority in the House. But don't smile. Republicans should smile because it's not based on the House voting. It's based on this. Each state delegation from the House votes. So Florida has 27 representatives. Wyoming has one. Hawaii has two. So the 27 from Florida get to cast one vote. The one person from Wyoming, Dick Cheney's daughter, gets to cast her one vote. The two from Hawaii cast their one vote. We go one, one, one. Uh, Florida right now is 14 Republicans, 13 Democrats. So Florida would cast its one vote Republican. So if we go one by one by one, in order to win the tiebreaker, someone needs a majority. A majority of 50 is 26. Right now, the Republicans control the congressional delegations in 26 of the states. So that way, if we went there, Trump would win by one vote. Boy, this is perfect, isn't it, everybody? Only in 2020. Uh, has this scenario ever happened before? I just said a moment ago, yes. Let me give you three examples 
that could provide legal and constitutional guidance in case if we have this madness after this election. And you know, the only way that 2020 can really end everybody is with this election blowing up, <laughs> right? We can't have a normal election. 2020 has been crazy. All right, so let me give you three examples when this has happened before. You're looking at the first one right now. On the left is Thomas Jefferson. On the right, Aaron Burr. The year was 1800. 1800 was between Jefferson and Adams. Jefferson beat Adams, <clears throat> but Jefferson tied with his vice president, Aaron Burr. 73 to 73 in an electoral college dead heat. Now, remember I told you back then that the person with the most votes became president, second most votes became vice. Remember I said we changed it in 1804? So even though Burr was supposed to be Jefferson's vice, because they tied, Jefferson said no big deal, but Burr being a little bit whacked and being an opportunist, Burr said, I wanna challenge Jefferson, so we had to have a tiebreaker. So they went to the house for each state to get one vote, and someone needed a majority, and they had to vote, and guess what happened? It was a tie. So they had a second vote, and it was a tie, and a third and a fourth. And um, the whole month of November, there was ties. The whole month of December, January and February, for four months, 35 ballots, they couldn't break the tie. Now, today our inauguration is January 20th, but back then they still had time because the inauguration was not until March 4th. So for four months and 35 ballots, they tied. On the 36th ballot, Alexander Hamilton and a group of Federalists, that was the party opposite of these guys, broke the tie. Uh, and Hamilton uh, orchestrated a tiebreaker to support Jefferson instead of Burr. Burr was pissed and shot Hamilton a few years later. So um, let's hope that doesn't happen in, 18, uh, in 2020, but who the hell knows? So there's a precedent for you. Four months, 36 ballots to break the tie. It happened again in the year 1824. That's John Quincy Adams at the bottom of your screen and Andrew Jackson at the top of your screen. I never liked Jackson. I always liked John Quincy, so it pains me to say this. In 1824, Jackson, it was a four-way race. There were four candidates. Jackson was ahead in the popular vote and Jackson was ahead in the electoral college. but he did not have a majority. So because he was shy of a majority, we had to have a tiebreaker. The tiebreaker, as you now know, goes to the states with each state delegation getting one vote. Henry Clay, one of my least favorite people, I can't stand the guy, one of my least favorite people from history, he orchestrated the tiebreaker. He cut a deal. It was called the corrupt bargain. Even though John Quincy Adams was in second place, Clay cut a deal and the Electoral College in the tiebreaker through the states voted that John Quincy won. So that happened in 18 to 24. So there could be a scenario where they picked the person who wasn't winning and that's perfectly legal and with precedent. The third example I'll give you is 1876. Uh, that's between the guy on the left looking like ZZ Top's bass player. That's Rutherford B. Hayes. The guy on the right looking really young is Samuel Tilden. In 1876, Hayes the Republican, Tilden the Democrat, neither one had a majority of the Electoral College. Now, Tilden was only one state away from winning, but because he didn't have a majority, we went to a tiebreaker. Now, the tiebreaker was complicated by each state legislature getting one vote because three Southern states wouldn't cooperate. They were fighting over seating their electors. What were the three Southern states in 1876? South Carolina, who is always a problem, uh, Louisiana, and Florida. But you knew I was gonna say that, right, everybody? Because it's always Florida. So those three states wouldn't participate. So here's what happened. The House Pat put together a committee, a 15-member committee to pick the president. Could they do that? Apparently. They put eight Republicans and seven Democrats on the committee. And in a straight party vote, they voted eight to seven and gave it to Rutherford B. Hayes, who won by one vote. <clears throat> so could we see it again? It's happened before. I don't know. What's going to happen with the Electoral College? 
So all of you know me, you know I always say, don't pay attention to the national polls because we don't have a national election. Ask Hillary. Biden's up comfortably double digits in some of the polls, but it doesn't matter because we don't have a national election. On November 3rd, we will have 51 individual elections, the 50 states and DC. What matters is state by state by state because we've had six times in our history when the electoral college hasn't picked the guy that won. It was a, it was a convoluted race, 1800, 1824, 1876, 1888, and then in 20, 2000 and 2016, the person that lost won the electoral college, that lost the popular vote. So what it is, it's a winner take all system. You heard me say each state gets electors equal to the size of their congressional delegation. So Florida has 27 reps and two senators. So we have 27 plus two, we have 29 electoral votes. And it doesn't matter if you win Florida by one vote or 1 million votes, you get all 29 of the votes. Got it, everybody? So it's a winner take all system and somebody needs 270. Now two states, just to make it convoluted, two states, Nebraska and Maine, don't cast their votes winner take all. How, why? They amended their state constitutions years ago to create what's called a district plan. Maine, for example, has two congressional districts, the way we have 27. Down here, Ted Deutsch has a district, Alcee Hastings has a district, Lois Frankel has a district. She's probably your representative, if I remember the map. It's hard to tell because the map looks like this. It looks like, it looks like Picasso drew it. Um, so, um, so Maine has two districts. So if Trump wins District 1, he gets that one vote. If Biden wins District 2, he gets that one vote. Then whomever wins statewide gets the two Senate votes. So it could be 3-1 instead of 4-0. So that's the way the Electoral College works. So let me uh, make so a prediction. We'll end it with a prediction. What's going to happen on November 3rd? Even though I didn't get any cookies tonight, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. So it's easy for all of us right now. Tammy and I can pick at least 40 of the 50 states and tell you exactly how they're going to vote on November 3rd. Why? Because in the last five presidential elections, 40 of the 50 states have voted the exact same way and it wasn't even close. So how is Hawaii going to vote on November 3rd, everybody? The answer, Democratic. Why? Because they always do. I hope you're playing along with your home trivia here and your drinking game. How's Alaska going to vote this year, everybody? Republican, why? Because they always do. I'm gonna make a prediction for you. How's Alaska going to vote in 2024? Republican, because they always do. How's Hawaii going to vote in 2028? Democratic, because they always do. Doesn't even matter who's running. How is the, how is the left coast going to vote? California, Oregon, and Washington. Democratic, because they always do, right? Um, how are the Rocky Mountain and Big Sky states going to vote? Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota, Utah, Wyoming, Idaho. How are they going to vote? Miss Bagish? Norman? How are they going to vote? Republican, because they always do. Good. What about the Midwest? Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska? How are they going to vote? Republican, because they always do. What about the South? Texas, Louisiana, Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, South Carolina, Tennessee, Arkansas, Kentucky, West Virginia. They're going to vote Republican because they always do. What about the Northeast? New York, Vermont, Massachusetts, New Jersey, uh, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Maryland. They're going to vote Democratic because they always do. So look at my little graph here. These are all the states that pretty much vote the same way all the time. Um, what we see is that the South the Republicans can rely on the entire South, but they can't rely on a single Northern state. Maybe they'll flip one. The Democrats can rely on the entire North, but they can't rely on a single Southern state. Maybe they'll flip one. So the Electoral College looks the exact same way every four years. Well, not exact, almost the same way, except for a couple states. Take a look. Here's the Electoral College in 2000, which looks like 2004 which looks like 2008, 
which looks like 2012, which looks like 2016, and there you go. So it looks the same all the time. So who's going to win on November 3rd? Here's the states that are going to count. Everybody looks at the big three. We have three big swing states. By swing states, I mean they're purple. They're not Republican red. They're not Democratic blue. We don't know how they're going to vote. The three big swings are Florida, Pennsylvania, and Ohio in order. Together, they have 70 electoral votes, which means if one candidate wins those three, it's over. I'm going to predict right now, if Biden wins all three of those, he wins. If Trump wins all three, he wins. In 2008, uh, around 7 p.m., when I used to work for our NBC station, WPPV5. I used to work for our PBS station, Channel 2 in Miami, for 15 years or more. Before I came here, wherever I lived, I taught around the country. I taught at uh, Yale, at Troy, at Georgetown, at Northern Arizona, at uh, Hawaii, at Stanford. I taught all over the place. I couldn't hold a job. <laughs> I just wanted to move around as an excuse to travel. Uh, and here we are now. Been here for 20 years, so longest I've ever been anywhere in my life. But um, so uh, it's the cookies at Glen Eagles. It's keeping me here, keeping me healthy. <laughs> I mean, I'm beating that joke to death. Okay, so uh, in 2008, I was working at NBC, I was on the desk, and I looked at all the exit polling over the commercial break about quarter of. Right before seven o'clock, uh, Kelly Dunn, the anchor said, Dr. Watson, who's gonna win? Uh, and I said, okay, the, we're still voting, but Obama's got this in the bag. Why? Because he's way ahead in Florida, Pennsylvania, and Ohio. And if he wins those three, which he was, and he did, there's no way McCain could have come back. Same thing in 2016, the anchor Michael Williams at seven o'clock said, Dr. Watson, what do you got for us? I said, Trump's the 45th president because he's way ahead in Florida, Pennsylvania, and Ohio. And he did win them all. And there you go. So look at those three states. There are three Western swing states, Colorado, Nevada, and New Mexico. Now they only have 19 votes between them, which isn't a lot, but in a really close race, that could be the deal. Now, remember, 2000 on, every presidential election from 2000 has been a nail biter. So that could be a kicker. I'm going to say don't look at those three Western swing states. Why? They've been drifting into the blue Democratic column. Why? A lot of Latinos are moving in there, a lot of Californian expats. They're becoming more and more Democratic to the point where every poll is showing that Biden will win Colorado, Nevada, and New Mexico. Here's the state's that everybody is looking at and where Trump and Biden are campaigning in nonstop right now at the bottom of your screen. Arizona, Florida, Michigan, North Carolina, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Virginia, and Wisconsin. Now, the good news for the Democrats um, is, that, um, is that there's no way Arizona and um, North Carolina should even be considered. Those were solid red Republican states, but now they're darn near a flip of the coin. The good news for the Republicans is Michigan and Wisconsin should not be in play. Those used to be blue Democratic states, but now they're a flip of the coin. So this election will come down to those eight states. This election will come down to probably two counties in each of those eight states, two per state. So just a percent of the country. Um, here's what I have. Here's your this is why you signed up tonight. Here's gonna, who's gonna win. So this week I got the electoral college map and I looked at all the poll, all the major polling and I filled in all the states in the electoral college map. Here's what I had, 290 votes for, in purple, look at purple, 290 votes for Biden. I got 163 votes for Trump and 85 were just too close to call. How many votes do you need to be president? And someone? Norman, 270, 270. So Biden wins. Um, now, if Trump wins all 85 votes, if he wins all the swing states that are too close to call right now, Biden still wins. It's just close because he's passed 270. So if the blue states stay blue, if voting turnout is normal, and it's going to be way higher than normal, and the higher the turnout, it usually benefits the Democrats. Um, 
Biden looks like he's got this thing. Uh, the only thing that the reason why I'm not popping the cork yet is because I think Trump and the Republicans have so many lawsuits, they're going to try to steal this thing. So look on the left and my Republican friends, I'm sorry, but I, I think they're doing it, they're trying. Uh, on the left, let's look at the states. Here's all the states that we've been talking about, looking at, and you can see almost all of them are leaning Democrat. Uh, Biden looks like he's going to carry all those. There's only four states right now that are a flip of the coin. Florida, Ohio, North Carolina, and Iowa. If Trump wins all four of those, Biden should still win, though. Biden, if he wins Florida, he's in good shape. If Trump wins Florida, he's got an outside shot. If, uh, if Trump loses Florida, it's hard to put the math together to get to 270 for him. Um, Florida is the key state, everybody, as you all know. Florida, Florida, Florida. Uh, Florida is the national bellwether. You know the term bellwether? That means as Florida goes, so goes the country. Get this, everybody. From 1960 until today, the person that won Florida has gone on to be president every single time but once. Wow, how about that? For the last 100 years, the person that has won Florida has gone on. You stay, you're paying attention, Stan, Mr. Goldberg? Okay, good. Judy, Susan, we all good. I see you. Good, you're. I can't believe you're awake. I'm ready to fall asleep. Good job. Good job. Uh, Jean, I can't see. It's too dark. I can't tell if she's taking a nap. Ruth's awake. Marlene, where are you? I'm looking at your ceiling. We'd rather see you. Oh wow, it's Marlene's. Oh good. I'd rather see Marlene than Marlene's husband. Good. Okay. And uh, okay, we got the Gersenfelds. Okay, they're in there. And good. Okay. Good. All right. So. For the last 100 years, just checking on everybody. <laughs> uh, and Captain Arthur is, is with us. He's, he's, he's paying it. The good. Good job, Captain. And thank you for your service. So for the last 100 years, get this, everybody. The person that has won Florida has gone on to be president every single time but twice. So it's Florida, Florida, Florida. Uh, the last Republican to be president without winning Florida was Calvin Coolidge. How about that? Here's the second reason why Florida is most important. When, 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 when experts and, and analysts make their predictions, they look at demographic groups. How's the black vote going to go? The Jewish vote, the Latino vote, the gay vote, the labor vote, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They look at how the vote's going to go. Here's what makes Florida fascinating. We have a huge population of every single demographic group. Florida has one of the largest black populations in the country. Florida has one of the largest Latino populations in the country. Florida has one of the largest gay populations in the country. Florida is one of the largest youthful populations in the country. We have some really, really big universities. Florida has the largest veterans population in the country. And I'm not sure about this. Uh, Norman, you let me know, give me a thumbs up or thumbs down, I'm not sure. But I'm going to go out on a limb and guess Florida may have one of the larger senior citizen populations. Norman, am I right? He's giving me a thumbs up. And I love his background, so I'm sticking with it. I'm sticking with it. That's my word. So um, uh, Florida is unique also because we're like all three regions of the country. It's basically three states or three regions. The northern part of Florida is like the south. The central part of Florida, Florida is like the Midwest. And the southern part of Florida is like the Northeast. I mean, that's why we say in Florida, the further north you go, the further south you are. Right? You guys all remember my joke. Am I allowed to tell a joke, Tammy? Okay, good. Since you've been drinking anyway. So here's my joke. Um, if we could take North Florida, cut it off, and give it to Alabama, we could raise the IQ of both states. <laughs> Which is probably true. Now you're looking at a map of Florida, friends. Florida's fascinating. Uh, we have 67 counties. You can see most of Florida is red, but here's the thing. The red parts, nobody lives there except Jacksonville and, and Duval County up there in the Northeast. So most of the red counties are, are not populated. There's very few, few blue Democratic counties, but that's where all the people are, like us down here. Palm Beach, Broward, Miami-Dade, and then you could throw Monroe in. 
So all the people were there, Orlando, Orange County. Now, um, uh, you can see there's a little blue spot up there in the panhandle, which is very conservative. That's Tallahassee. Uh, uh, here's the thing. Every state capital in the country is Democratic, uh, no matter where. Why? Because there's a lot of government employees, a lot of lawyers, tends to be a big university population, better educated people. So state capitals are always blue. Um, look, there's a little blue donut hole in the northern central part of the state. That's Gainesville. Why? Because universities are always blue. And that's a massive university, thousands and thousands of students and thousands and thousands of professors. Uh, but Florida is 50-50. Uh, is, uh, even though more red counties than blue counties. Let me end this thing. I'm going to skip that. I'm going to end with just a little advice for you. So don't listen to me. Uh, listen to the, well, that's always good advice. <laughs> it's my wife's line. Um, so um, Nate Silver, you're looking at Nate. I think Nate is one of the best in the business. I'm a fan of his. In 2008 and 2012, he was closer than any other analyst in the country. In 2008 and 2012, I went 51 for 51. I called all the states uh, and I called DC both times, but Nate was closer in terms of a percentage. He, he developed, now he was wrong in 2016, but who wasn't? Um, Nate developed uh, an algorithm, a mathematical algorithm, and he gets all these data points, feeds them into the computer and it spits out the answer. And you know, data analytics, man, he gets it right. Uh, so, so his website's called 538, everybody. Take a look at it. And Nate will break down all the states, all the races and everything. He's very good. Here's the guy who's the best in the business. That's Alan Lickman. He's a professor at American University, where my son is a junior, studying to be a diplomat. Uh, and also music. He plays in the jazz band. So um, Alan Lickman is a professor of history at American University. He's the only major analyst who got 2016 right, and he's nine for nine. He has called the last nine presidential elections on the button. Alan uses 13 data points, uh, keys to look at his elections. In 2016, he said seven favored Trump, six favored Hillary. He said Hillary will win the popular vote big. Trump will win the electoral college by two or three states in a close one. He called it. So if you need lottery numbers, uh, Captain, just call Alan Lickman and he'll hook you up. Um, again, a, a real good guy, bad to pay, but a good guy. Um, Alan has already ran his numbers for 2020. He says it's seven to six again, favoring Biden. Biden will win the popular vote big and win the electoral college by about three states in a close race. So check out Alan Lickman, okay? Uh, Here's another one I always look at, and I'm trying to make you laugh, since it's ho almost Halloween. Halloween mask sales. Get this. They were correct in 2016. In the last eight elections, whichever candidate sold more masks on Halloween a couple days before the election ended up winning. So I've done media for 20 years. I quit two years ago because I, I don't have time to sleep, uh, yet alone have a fifth job. I already have four. Um, so, um, I, you know, <clears throat> when you work in the media, I would talk for weeks about the election. So I needed stuff to fill my time. So I'd always talk about Halloween mask sales. So um, whomever sells more masks always wins. So stay tuned next weekend. One week from today, when you're out trick-or-treating there at Glen Eagles, be sure to save me some chocolate when I come out and then see who sold the most masks. My guess is this is an advantage for Trump. Trump will sell more masks than Biden because that's the, he's the scariest thing I can think of. Here's one more for you to look at. Vigo County, Indiana. Uh, get this. They were right in 2016, and they are 16 for 16. You go, you go back 17 presidential elections before Vigo got it wrong. There's something about this little county in western Indiana uh, that how Vigo County votes is how the country votes. So something about it, it's a microcosm of the country. What is it about it? I don't know. I haven't been there and don't want to go either. So, um, okay, thanks everybody. There's the 10 questions I get all the time. And there's your predictions. And you're, now you know the dates. So when you hear it by 
politicians, you know the dates. Now you know what the Constitution says about it. Now you know what the laws say about it. And now you know the precedents from history and how it worked. Okay, Tammy, you guys All have right. a Thanks. Okay, everybody, that was uh, quite uh, ed educational. <laughs> Let's hope so. <laughs> Oh my God. So we do have a few questions that people did text in. Um, I don't know if you were able to see them. So I think if we go back to the, um, the court, um, somebody asked about how can the court be unpacked? Is it last one in, first one out? The courts can be unpacked in two ways. Number one, a justice dies or retires and the president simply doesn't fill it. Uh, and that happened in, uh, 1801. The way it's been unpacked the, a time since then is LIFO, last in, first out. So if we want to get it back to its original six, uh, we get rid of Gorsuch, uh, Kavanaugh, and Barrett, because they're the last three in, Trump's three appointments. And I find it ironic that the three of them talk originalism all the time, <laughs> and yet they'd be the three to go if we went back to originalism. So um, that's how it would work. Joe Biden and Kamala Harris have not answered questions about packing. They're blatantly uh, sidestepping it, which leads me to believe that they're seriously considering packing the court. Um, I have two views on this. Number one, I personally don't want them to do it. I just don't think anybody should mess with anything anymore. We're too polarized. Leave it alone. Uh, it's been there since Grant. Um, however, secondly, should they want to do it, I think they're perfectly capable. I, I think they're within the right because it is legal. You don't need the Constitution. And the, over the last 20 years, the 10 states that have tried to do this, are, it's all Republicans who did it. And the Republicans, Mitch McConnell, packed the court by denying Obama over 100 appointments for well over a year, which is utterly, utterly without precedent in American history. Abraham Lincoln, in uh, October of 1864, there was a Supreme Court seat that opened up, like now, October. And we never have, you know, they didn't have early voting back then, but you never, you never had somebody pick this, this close. Uh, Lincoln, for two reasons, did not appoint that seat. He said it should wait until after the election. Uh, so there you go. Any other questions, Tammy? Uh, somebody mentioned something about the, Nash, the national popular vote. Um, which and they talked about, uh, are there 15 states who signed a compact that all the states electoral votes for the okay. winner? So here's what you have. Um, we have this electoral college and technically the electors who gather the first Monday after the second Wednesday in December in state capitals or December 14th this year, technically they are free agents. So if Tammy's an elector, and she's in a state that voted for Biden, she could vote Trump. Or if she's in a state that voted Trump, she could vote Biden. You're allowed to do that. So here's the thing. There's a national popular vote compact, as the questioner asked, and you're right. And it's saying it's asking those states to pledge, no matter what, would they vote the way the people voted? Uh, and we have a lot of states that have signed off on it. So there you go. Here's the Are problem. They bound? Here's no, that's, a, that's what a good point, Tammy. That's where I was going with it. They're not legally bound. They're not legally bound. And today we are so polarized that it's hard to imagine a Trump state that would say, okay, Biden won, we'll go to, or a Biden state that would say, okay, Trump won. So they're not legally bound. Now, I do think we should amend the Electoral College and just have a national popular vote. We don't elect any other office in the country the way we elect the president. And no one in the world has such a crazy system as the Electoral College. In fact, everybody, the framers didn't even like it, but they thought it was the least dangerous option because they were creating a brand new form of government and they didn't know if people would vote. They didn't know how it would work. We didn't have a civic ethic or a civil ethos. They had to, the framers viewed it as, this will help teach people about voting and then we can get rid of it. I think they'd be shocked that we still have the darn thing. Can the uh, presidential term um, ever be changed? Yes. How would that ever happen? The presidential term can be changed, and it was changed. Um, so uh, initially, Alexander Hamilton proposed a seven-year term uh, and an unlimited number of terms. Uh, 
So what we had was we had a four-year term for the president, a four-year term. The 22nd Amendment to the Constitution, which took effect, not when it was passed, when it took effect, took effect in 19, took effect in 1953. The 22nd Amendment limited a president to two terms. So technically, the way it reads, the maximum number of years a president can serve is 10. Two four-year terms, that's eight. So think of this. Let's say the vice president. If the president dies in, in the second two years of his term, the vice president can finish that term two years and then have two full terms or 10. If the president dies in the first two years of his term, the vice president finishes that one term and then only has one four-year term or six years. So the maximum amount is 10 years, two four-year terms plus two years. Um, so if we amended the Constitution again, Tammy, we could amend it to say three terms. Trump has joked probably 50 times, I should just serve for life, shouldn't I get a third term? But as everybody knows, Donald Trump has no sense of humor and every book that's been written about him says his jokes are always his way of talking, telling the truth, which he rarely does. So um, um, yeah, we could amend it. You know, here's the irony. Personally, I don't like term limits for a president but I do want him for the Supreme Court. I don't favor him for Congress. Um, I think we have a system of term limits. It's called voting. So, okay. Um, how much did the uh, majority leader of the Senate, um, why or why? Why, did the, why do they have so much power? Yeah, you're right. I mean, whomever asked that question, that's the million dollar question. I've been complaining about that my whole career and now especially that Mitch McConnell has finagled it. You know. The House has passed a few hundred bills, including months and months ago, more COVID relief, months and months ago, uh, more uh, an economic relief for this uh, recession and all sorts of things. Mitch McConnell hasn't taken a single one of those bills up. Even if 99 members of the Senate wanted it, McConnell's finagling the rules. So uh, the majority leader in the Senate has a lot of power. Shouldn't, they have too much power. Throughout history, we've occasionally seen them wield it, but we've never seen anything like McConnell. What McConnell's doing, what McConnell is doing is not illegal. It's, 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 you can do it. What McConnell is doing is unprecedented and grotesquely unethical. He's using rules, procedures, little, little small rules to massage it and, uh, and hold up everything. Uh, so, um, yeah, we've never quite seen anything like this. And in a democracy, everybody, I, as I said earlier, I don't think life terms work for just nine people in the, in, the, in the Supreme Court. In a democracy, one person from Kentucky should not be able to hold up the entire nation's legislative agenda, which he has done. He did it under Obama, and then he's doing it again now. All right. Well, I think um, that does it for our questions. Um, I think someone mentioned more about the Electoral College and uh, wasn't it formed to give rural states more power? Okay. It was, it was not formed to give rural states more power per se, but smaller rural states today perceive that it gives them a bit more power because it's a winner take all. They get to cast all their votes as one. So that's why a lot of rural smaller states favor it. The framers put it together for lots of reasons. The main reason was they didn't know, you know, how democracy would work. Another reason, they didn't trust us. They thought we might pick the, a dictator and a dupe. Um, so they figured by allowing themselves to come in and vote, they could undo the damage. And then logistically, in the year 1792, for example, how do you print a nationwide ballot if you had a popular vote? I mean, hell, Palm Beach County still can't print a ballot, am I right? Um, and half the public was illiterate. So th that's all the reasons they put it in. So let me just end by saying a couple quick things. One, be sure to vote, everybody. Um, and yes, your vote by mail counts, and you can go to a drop box. You can vote early. If you want to vote early, you can go to any voting site that's open in the county. On election day, you must go to your assigned precinct. If you requested an absentee or vote by mail and you decide you want to vote in person, you still can. You just need to bring that vote by mail with you. If you want to vote by mail, make sure it has your signature on it 
and it matches your normal signature. And otherwise, all that, I mean, typically all that is, is completely reliable. Uh, you can go to a drop box and do it. So make sure you vote. Make sure you all stay safe, wear your masks, socially distance. If anybody wants to go on a fun cruise,